Hello everyone, welcome back to CS224N and today I'm delighted to introduce our final guest speaker, um, Yulia Svetkov. So Yulia is currently a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, but actually starting from next year, she's going to be a professor at the University of Washington, as you can already see updated in her email address. Um, Yulia's research focuses on extending the capabilities of human language technology beyond individual cultures and across language boundaries. So lots of work that considers the roles of human beings and different multilingual situations. And today she's going to be giving a talk to us on social and ethical considerations in NLP um, systems. Just one more note on the um, way things are going to run. Um, so Yuli has some interactive exercises. So what we're going to do is for the interactive exercises, you'll be asked to put something into the Zoom comments. So that, uh, oh, sorry, the Zoom chat. So that means really using the chat and you might want to set who the two to the chat is to, I think it's by default panelists, which is okay, or to Yulia, so it goes to her uh, panelists is good, but probably not all attendees, because that'll be a bit overwhelming. And then if you have questions, um, put them in the Q&A as usual, because they'll keep the two um, streams separate. And as for our other invited um, lectures, if you've got some questions that you'd like to ask Yulia at the end, um, stay on the line and raise your hand and we can promote people to be um, panelists and have a chat with Yulia. Okay, so without further ado, I'm delighted to have you, Yulia. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm very excited uh, to speak to you all today, despite, unfortunately, I cannot see you, but I'm excited. And uh, uh, so this lecture is uh, structured as follows. We'll have uh, three parts. The first part will be primarily a discussion in which I will ask questions. It's supposed to be interactive, but I realize we, we are very limited in ways we can interact now. So this is when please put uh, responses if you want in the chat window, and I will answer my own questions following also your responses and maybe read some of your responses. So this will be the first part. And the goal of this part is to provide you some practical tools when you have a new problem to work on in um, AI, in, in your field, uh, how would you assess this problem in terms of how ethical it is to solve it, what kind of biases it may incorporate and so on. So in the second part, I will try to generalize, to give a review of what are uh, overall topics in the intersection of ethics in NLP because it's actually a very big field and what I will talk about today is just a motivational lecture but there is a lot of technical interesting technical content and a lot of subfields of this field and I will dive a little deeper in one topic in this field uh, specifically focusing on algorithmic bias and if time is left, which I'm not sure about, I will talk about one or two um, projects in my lab, so specific research projects. But if we don't have time to cover it, then you can always read the paper. So the first, first two parts are more important for the purpose of this lecture. So let's start. Uh, this is, as far as I understand, this is a course on uh, deep learning and natural language processing. So you probably covered various deep learning architectures and their applications to various NLP tasks, like, like machine translation, dialogue systems, question answering. And there is an obvious question, uh, what does it all has to do with ethics? What does syntactic parsing or part of speech tagging has to do with ethics? And uh, the answer, which I want to suggest is uh, this quote, that the, it's a simple answer that the common misconception is that language has to do with words, but it doesn't. It has to do with people. So every word, every sentence that we produce, language is produced by people. It is directed towards other people. And everything that is related to language necessarily involves people. And it has social meaning and incorporates human biases. And uh, this is why also models that we build um, the, which will be used by other people may incorporate social biases. So this is why decisions that we make about our data, uh, all kinds of considerations that we incorporate 
uh, into our model may have direct people on uh, direct impact on people and maybe societies. And uh, to start this lecture, we need to start with uh, understanding um, what is ethics. So what is ethics? Here is a definition from a textbook on ethics. Ethics is a study of what are good and bad ends to pursue in life and what is right and wrong to do in the conduct of life. So it is a practical discipline. And the primary goal is to determine how one ought to live and what, what actions one ought to do in the conduct of one's life. So to summarize, it is very practical and it's simple. It's just uh, doing the good things and doing the right things. And then my question to you is how simple it is to, divide, to define what is good and what is right. So let's start a discussion by diving into various problems. And we start with a boring theoretical problem, which everybody knows about, which is a trolley dilemma. And we'll, we won't spend too much time on it. So just to, I'm sure all of you know about it. So it's a classical problem in ethics in which, uh, so this is you standing near, near the lever and here is a trolley coming and there are several people. So the trolley cannot see the people and the people cannot see the trolley and you are the only one um, in control, in charge. You can save people and uh, maybe you need to make decisions about people's life. And you ask yourself, why me? <laughs> but uh, the point here is that uh, imagine that uh, there are five people on one side and uh, no one on the other side. And then I would ask you, would you pull the lever to save five people if the trolley is supposed to go straight? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, if I would ask you interactively, everybody would say, yes, I will pull the lever. And then I will follow up with the next question. Okay, what about if five people on one side and only one person on the other side? So would you pull the lever to minimize uh, the number of uh, lives that will be sacrificed. And uh, some people will not answer, some people will say yes, some people will say no, and those who will say yes, I will ask them, what if this one person is your brother, and uh, on the other side, just five random people? <laughs> what would be your answer? And I can go on and on and on to make this problem harder and harder. And uh, as you can imagine, there are, it, the answers are difficult. And also, we don't know what the answer will be in the actual situation. And while this problem is uh, theoretical, it is in part becoming relevant now when we talk about self-driving cars. So I am now moving to closer to the topics that we will discuss today. And I want to introduce a new problem, which I call the chicken dilemma. So in this dilemma, let's train a classifier. And in, uh, uh, this is, will be a simple CNN classifier. And uh, the classifier, the input to the classifier is an egg. And uh, uh, the classifier needs to define the gender of the chicken, of the chick. So, and uh, decides if it's a hen, it will go to lay, egg laying farm. And if it's a rooster, it will go to a meat farm. So first of all, do you think you can build such a classifier? I'm sure every student in this course will easily build this classifier and I'm sure it will have uh, quite a good accuracy. And then the question to you is, do you think it is ethical? And I invite you to type your responses in the chat. Yes, no. I mean, you can, you can justify a little bit. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for participating. So could you repeat the question? So the question is, uh, there is an egg and you need to determine the gender of the chick. And if it's a rooster, it will go to a meat farm. And if it's a hen, it will go to an egg laying farm. And uh, the question is, is this ethical? So there are all kinds of responses. Let's see. So yes and oh, no. 
but you can use exact same thing to target ethnic groups instead of chickens. So yes, thank you. And I see there are many interesting responses here. I just, the amount of responses, I, I cannot even have time to read them because, so anyway, so based on this question, I can tell you what my thoughts are. So as a vegetarian, I uh, maybe think it's unethical, but as a mother, I actually want my kids to eat meat. And whether I think it's ethical or not, we are doing this anyway today. And there are all kinds of considerations, uh, pro and cons. For example, this is what already is done today. And then maybe such classifier will minimize the suffering of the animal. But on the other hand, we hope that in the future society, uh, the life of a chicken will be as valuable as the life of a person. And I can continue on and on, but from this example, I also don't want to stay on it too long. You can see that the questions of ethics are difficult, that whether like you, you don't know too much about the, uh, this field, but uh, you can feel what is the right answer. So ethics is inner guiding, it's moral principles, and uh, uh, there are often no easy answers. So there are many gray areas. And importantly, ethics changes over time with the values and beliefs of people. So whatever we discuss today, we can think it's ethical or not ethical, but uh, it may change in a hundred of years and maybe a hundred years ago, this would not even be a question why this would be unethical. And another important point is that uh, this is what we are doing today. So what is ethical is what is legal is not necessarily aligned. We can do legal things that, that will still be unethical. And now having this primer, I want to move to the actual problems, the actual problems that we can kind of be asked to build and decide whether we want to build them or not. And the way I will guide this discussion is I will ask you specific questions. I will ask you for your answers. And I realize it's very difficult to read the chat for specific answers, but the point is that the types of questions that I will ask you, these would be the questions that you could ask yourself when you need to build the technology. And maybe the question whether something is ethical or not is a difficult question, but uh, let's try to break down uh, analysis of a specific application of a specific model to kind of derive an answer which, uh, which will give us some tools to derive an answer in an easier way. So here is the next classifi uh, classifier that we want to build. We want to build an IQ classifier. So we will be talking about predictive technology. So uh, based on people's personal data, for example, facial images, and maybe we can collect this uh, the text of these people on social media. media. Um, let's predict the IQ of the person. So uh, if you don't know what IQ is, IQ is a, uh, uh, is a general capacity of an individual to consciously adjust uh, the thinking to new requirements. So it's basically how intelligent a person is. So this is already not a hypothetical problem. You can collect individuals' data, you can collect uh, their texts online, and you, collect, and you can collect training data to predict people's IQ. But when I will ask you, is this an ethical question or not? It might be a difficult question to answer immediately. Thank you very much for participating. I really appreciate it. I hope I can save this chat later and to read your answers. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Uh, we need to uh, predict people's IQ from their photos and text. And then the first question that if I ask you, is it ethical or not? I don't know. And then you can ask yourself first, who would benefit from such a technology? So can you think who would benefit from a technology that uh, predicts an IQ of a person? Uh, 
hiring, right, employers, schools, universities. So I see your answers, right. So overall, it can be a useful technology, right? Um, immigration services can benefit from it, right? And invite only um, smart people to immigrate to a country, right? It, it, even individuals with high IQ can benefit from this, right? Because uh, they would maybe not need to do GRE and SAT. Will, they will not need to write essays. They will just need to show their IQ. Okay, so this technology can potentially be useful. And then uh, the, the next question is, let's assume we can build such a technology. I will show you later that we actually cannot. But even if we can build such a technology, let's think about corner cases and understand who can be harmed by this technology. So basically, what is the potential for dual use? How this technology can be misused? So assume that the classifier is 100% accurate now for a second. And uh, please think about it and type what do you think, who can be harmed from such a classifier and how this classifier can be misused? Right, so I can see answers and uh, I wish we can have this in interactive, but I, I can try to summarize what I have read so far. So first of all, one of you wrote that IQ is, uh, let me just answer my question because it's difficult to summarize the chat. Yeah, the, interact the interactive feature is difficult. So, so I, I, would, I, I would think about it in this way. First of all, why would we want to build such a classifier? So to build a classifier to predict an IQ, uh, companies, universities, they don't really need to know your IQ. What they're trying to predict is uh, your future success, the way you will succeed in a job or the way you will study at school. And then uh, the question is, is IQ is the right proxy for future success? And the answer is no. IQ correlates with future success, but it's not necessarily the right proxy for future success. And then who are people who could be harmed? For example, people who have lower IQ, but very hardworking people. People who have lower IQ, but have uh, good soft skills. So uh, assuming that, uh, so first of all, the IQ as a proxy of future success is an incorrect biased proxy. And the, this kind of problem of using a proxy to the actual label, because we cannot have the actual label, the future success, we cannot have this label, is actually very, very common in other types of predicting technology. If you think about parole decisions, technology that uses, that decides on parole decisions, what they want to predict is whether the individual recommit the crime. But this is a label that is very hard to obtain. And this is why they might resort to another label, whether, they, whether this individual will be um, convicted of a crime again and build this technology to predict future conviction. But conviction of a crime is a biased proxy of uh, the actual objective that we want to have, the, the likelihood to, to make the crime. And this is one example of a biased proxy, which does not allow us, us to build the right application for the goals that we have. So this is one problem. The second problem is IQ test itself. It is a biased test. So actually we cannot build a pro, uh, an accurate classifier for uh, future, for the right IQ. And also, if we look at the data that we use, this data, picture, photos, or social media, this data is biased itself. So there are all kinds of biases because of which we cannot actually build the right model. 
This is why this classifier will not be 100% accurate, but there will be many individuals who can be harmed. And then there will be questions, for example, um, assume our, our classif the classifier that we build is not actually accurate, but it has high accuracy, for example, 90% or 95%. And then I would ask you, is 95% a good accuracy or 99% a good accuracy? And then the, uh, the questions to think about is whether, um, what would happen with misclassification? What would, what would be an impact on individual lives if the classifiers make mistakes? And in this case, the important point is that uh, the cost of misclassification is very high. It has effect on people's life. So accuracy may be not the right evaluation uh, measure for this classifier. And another question that I could ask is, uh, for example, this condition on the slide that we find out that white females have 99% accuracy, but people with blonde hair under age 25 have only six. 60% accuracy. So what does it tell you about this classifier? Right, so the, the data set itself is biased. This means, this means basically that people with blonde hair under the age of 25 are underrepresented in your data set. So there are all kinds of questions and all kinds of probing questions that you can ask about the classifier to understand, is this the right problem to solve? Who can be harmed? Am I optimizing towards the right objective? Is my data biased? And what is the cost uh, of misclassification? How do I assess the potential for dual use and how much harm this technology can bring in addition to how much, how useful it can be. And the one last question, which is a hard one, uh, I want to ask you who is responsible. So I'm your manager in Google and you're working and I come to you and I ask you, please build an IQ classifier. And you build an IQ classifier and you publish a paper about the IQ classifier. And uh, this paper is publicized on media. So, and then the question is who is responsible? Is it the researcher or developer? Is it the manager? Is it the reviewer who didn't catch the problems with IQ classifier? Is it university or company or is it society? Yeah, so there is one nice answer that I want to read is that all of us should be responsible. So in practice, there is very little awareness about understanding what problems are ethical or not. And there is no clear policies here, right? This is a complicated issue and it's not clear who is responsible. This is why assuming that and of whoever is aware of such dangers should be responsible. So I, I don't know what is the right answer to this question. So now what is the difference between the chicken classifier and the Q classifier? Right, so one of your answers is that one is affects people and one does not, right? And while chicken classifier actually affects chicken lives and the Q classifier will not kill anyone, it can harm but will not kill, we do feel that IQ classifier currently is, uh, can have potentially worse impacts. So AI systems are pervasive in our world and the question about ethics are specifically raised commonly about people-centered AI systems. And these systems are really pervasive. So they interact with people like conversational agents. They reason about people such as profiling uh, applications or recommendation systems. They affect people in other lives like parole decision applications that I mentioned, uh, face recognition, voice recognition. All of these actually have this component of prediction, predictive technology and the human-centered technology. 
And this is why ethics is critical here. So I want to move to a next study. The next study is uh, a study of uh, detecting. Um, so we again build a classifier and we want to identify uh, the ability to accurately identify one's sexual orientation from mere observation. So this study is called AI Gaydar. So, and there are, as I mentioned, many similar studies, studies that predict potential for terrorist attacks, studies that predict uh, predictive policing. And also if you heard about Cambridge Analytica, all of them incorporate very similar technology. So let's talk about the about AI Gaydar study. And the goal is to understand again, what kind of questions we could ask about this study and what kind of uh, pitfalls we could prevent if we would ask these questions. So uh, to summarize the study, uh, the research question is, uh, I, we need to identify the sexual orientation from uh, people's images. And uh, the data collection process is that we can download photos from a popular American dating website and uh, there are 35,000 pictures, uh, all white, uh, equally represent, equal representation for gay and straight, for male and female. Everybody is represented uh, evenly. Uh, the method that was used uh, is a deep learning model to extract facial features and grooming features. And then a logistic regression classifier applied uh, to classify the final label, gay or straight. And the accuracy of this classifier is 81% uh, for men and 74% for women. So this is a summary of the study. And uh, I, I see rightfully asked questions, why would we ever need such an AI system? Uh, this is a good question, but uh, I don't want to publicize this study or disparage specific researcher, but this is a good study to present as an example of what could go wrong at all levels of the study. So this is why I'm discussing it now. So what went wrong here? So let's start with an ethics of the research question. So is it ethical at all to predict sexual orientation from facial, from any kind of uh, features. And I, I see a lot of comments and thank you for the comments. Um, so first of all, this is not a new research question. Uh, from 19th century, there were multiple studies to correlate sexual identity with some external features. Uh, people were, and then with genetics, people were looking for gay genes, gay brains, gay ring fingers and so on. So maybe moving from 19th century uh, to 21st sec century, uh, we can again ask who can be used, who can benefit from such a classifier and who can be harmed by such a classifier. So what do you think? Who could benefit from such a classifier? So, Autocratic governments, right? But also maybe dating apps, advertisers, conservative religious groups, and so on. So we could think who could who would want to use such a classifier. Um, then maybe who can be harmed by such a classifier? Now, again, assuming we, we, we are not thinking if it's possible at all build such a classifier, and as you can guess, we will see that it's not possible, but what would stop you from building such a classifier? What do you think could, could be harmful in this classifier? So, yeah, thank you for your answers. Uh, I will summarize them. So um, many people can be harmed by such classifier. And uh, I summarize basically many of your answers here in this slide. 
So this potentially can be a dangerous technology. So in many countries, being gay person is prosecutable by law uh, and uh, it can lead even to death penalty. It might affect people's employment, relationships, health opportunities, right? Uh, importantly, this is not only about sexual orientation. So uh, there are many attributes, including sexual identity, that are private for people, right? These are protective attributes and uh, they, are, they can be non-binary, they can be intimate and not visible publicly. And most importantly is that these attributes are specifically those attributes against which people are discriminated against. And this is why it is basically dangerous to build such a technology. So in the paper, in the published paper, the argument for building this, for basically presenting this study was that um, this study is an alert how easy it is to build such a classifier. Uh, and uh, basically an alert for, uh, to expose the threat to the privacy and safety of people. And then I would be interested to hear if you have counter arguments to this argument. Okay, so basically there can be many counter arguments. One of them is that this is a classifier, this technology. So like a knife is a technology and with a knife you can kill people and you can cook food, right? And you don't, you not necessarily need to kill people with a knife to expose the dangers and harms of this technology, right? And another issue is that this is actually not possible to build such a classifier with the data that researchers had. And this is what we will see when we will discuss um, kind of additional details about the data. And another comment is, as I said, uh, this is only one instance of such a technology. The, here is another instance, which is, uh, it's a successful startup called Faceception, which, uh, um, has drawn a lot of funding and uh, its goal is to identify terrorists based on facial features. And uh, unlike in the previous study, the startup doesn't show how they, what technology they develop, but uh, you can guess that it can uh, have uh, similar dangers. So in general, uh, building predictive technology is very pervasive, it's ubiquitous, but it is always, in, it, and sometimes it's not as, and of um, clear cut unethical. For example, uh, many people in NLP published papers on predicting gender from comments. And the, it is not clear basically when uh, the, uh, the technology is clearly harmful and unethical and where it can be actually used for, in good ways. For example, we all want uh, our search to work, right? And to work well and to be personalized, uh, the algorithm actually needs to know something about us. So again, this is not an easy question, but in the case of the dark classifier, maybe the, it's already on the extreme. Okay, let's move to the data. Um, again, to discuss basically uh, what questions could we ask about the data? So here's how the data was collected. So photos were downloaded from a popular American dating website. They were public. And uh, there were a uh, few, so, few so, uh, thousand of images, all white and the balanced data set. And my first question is, uh, what can you say about the data? So is it okay to use this data if there is no robots.txt, the photos are public, what can be counter arguments to using people's uh, photos from a dating website?
There is a there is a hint <laughs> on the on the slide. Lack of consent. People did not intend to for their photos to be used to build a classifier. Private information. Right. So thank you for your answers. So the points that I wanted to emphasize here is that it was legal to collect this data. But again, it's not clear whether it was ethical to collect this data because as you said, people did not provide, maybe did not provide, 35,000 people did not provide consent for using specifically this data. And there are more important and global issue here is that there is a difference between data that is public and data which is publicized. So public, it's fine because these people want to be found by the social uh, circle that they are targeting when they publish their photo on the dating website. But this does not mean necessarily that they want to be found by a broader social circle, by their families, by uh, their colleagues and so on. So there is a big difference between the data that is public and the data which is publicized. So overall, even if they did not violate state uh, terms of service, I don't know about it. I didn't read uh, in depth, actually. But uh, they did violate the social contract because this was not the intent of the user to, for their data to be used in this way. Next question uh, about data. So what do you think about this data set? 35,000 of pictures, uh, all white, uh, balanced in terms of sexual orientation and balanced in terms of gender. <laughs> Too white. <laughs> okay, so does not represent the population. So, right. So basically you can guess that this data set has many, many biases incorporated. It contains only white people, only people who, has, who self disclose their sexual identity. It, uh, it is, represents very certain social groups, people who put their photos on the dating website of specific age, of specific uh, ethnicity. And basically these are photos that were carefully selected to be attractive. So uh, to, to, to the target audience. So this data set contains many types of biases. And also, as uh, one of you mentioned, and as written on this slide, that this data set is balanced, which does not represent the whole, uh, the true distribution in the population. So what does it mean? This means that uh, this model uh, is built on a very biased data set and uh, you as uh, students at Stanford, you understand that it cannot be used, for example, on a non-white population. It cannot be used on uh, photos of people not from that uh, dating website. We don't actually know how this, what this classifier learned. Maybe this, the most important features were the watermark of this specific website, I don't know, or some other uh, confounds, spurious confounds. But the point is that once the classifier is out, those who want to use it maliciously, they don't know that this technology is actually not applicable for any other data set except for this specific data set. So this technology is biased and it also shows that it's basically not a credible uh, result. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, and uh, final question is that basically this is a deep learning model. It's a black box model. And then there is a the question of uh, how to analyze errors in a deep learning model, specifically when we work on such a critical, such a sensitive uh, topics like predictive technology, not necessarily predicting sexual orientation, but for example, predicting gender, which is again used in many companies. So it is very difficult to understand uh, whether it is okay to use this technology. But the point is that we need to be able to analyze it and uh, 
evaluated properly. And the, the last point is about the accuracy. Again, and I'm going back to the points that I mentioned also in the IQ classifier. So the accuracy of this classifier is 81% for men and 74% for women. Is it a good accuracy or is it a bad accuracy? So the numbers are okay for some tasks, but not for others. But importantly, for this, specific, for this type of problem, it's important to understand that the cost of misclassification is not equal to the cost of correct prediction. And here is kind of uh, visual examples. So um, if my algorithm misclassifies my dog as a cookie, um, is the cost misclassification uh, of this misclassification is high or low? So I guess it's just funny, right? It's, uh, it, it's funny, there is nothing offensive here. And then the next question, if my algorithm misclassifies uh, me with my dog, is the cost of uh, misclassification high or low? It can be funny, but maybe not for everyone. We already don't know. And then the photo that I don't put here, but the one that is maybe many of you have heard is the gorilla incident that happened in Google in 2016. So in this case, uh, there was a misclassification of an African American woman with a gorilla. And to understand how expensive is the cost of this misclassification, we need to understand the whole history of dehumanization of uh, black people in the US and so on. So we, we can see the difference for the same algorithm and same types of errors. There are different types of errors that are more expensive than others. So this is why it is important to assess AI systems adversarially. And now I just want to reiterate the types of questions that I asked, because these are the kinds of questions that you might want to ask yourself next time when you need to build another predictive technology. And the first is to understand the ethics of the research question. And sometimes it's not very easy to understand, but just ask yourself these more specific questions. If I build this technology, who could benefit from such a technology? and who can be harmed by it. So try to see the corner cases. And also, what about the data? Could sharing this data have major effect on people's lives? Like in the case of um, AI gay dark classifier. The next question that you can ask is about privacy. What we discuss, who owns the data? And is this data not only public or legal to use, but also is it are we violating the social uh, basically circles to which the data is publicized? Are we violating a social contract in the way that it, the public data is expected to be used? And user consent is not always um, possible to obtain, but uh, we need to understand Im implicit assumptions of people who put their data online. Now, uh, the next question is what, what are possible biases in data? What are artifacts in data? What are uh, distributions for specific populations and subpopulations? How representative or what kind of misrepresentations are in my data? And next is uh, what is basically potential bias in these models? Do I, when I build this model, do I control for confined variables? And do I optimize for the right objective, like in the case of the IQ classifier? And also, if I have biases, does my system amplify biases? And finally, it is not enough to measure accuracy because uh, the kind of semantics of false positives and false negatives can be different. Sometimes the cost of misclassification is much higher than the cost of correct prediction. So, uh, also need to understand how to evaluate the models properly. And why is it especially relevant now is because as you all know, uh, there is an exponential growth of user generated data and it's really easy to build the tools. Each of us can build the IQ classifier or GATE-DAR, but the question is 
what kind of technology we will produce. So this finishes, uh, in this I finish the first part of discussion and I put in this slide some recommended papers on talks specifically on the kind of introductory topics on the impact of NLP and I think these are, there, there are hundreds or thousands of similar talks but I, like these are my favorites so if you want to read more please take a look. Should I stop for questions or should we move to the next uh, the part. Uh, right at the moment, there aren't any outstanding questions. So maybe it's okay to move on unless anyone's desperately typing. <laughs> okay. And the chat window is really nice. There are so many responses. Thank you all. And I, I hope to get later this uh, chat I, I, file I think, to read it. <laughs> I think we can save it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we can move on to the second part about algorithmic bias. So what are the topics in the intersection of ethics in NLP? Uh, so the first one is algorithmic bias, and uh, this is about bias in data and NLP models. And this is something that I will talk more in the second part. But it's important to understand that the field is much broader. So the next uh, topic is incivility. So ability to develop NLP tools, to identify, to actually data analytics, to understand the hate speech, toxicity, incivility online. And this is a very complicated field because it's not only about building the right classifiers. There are many, many questions such as if I post hateful comment, who does this comment belong to? Does it belong to a company? Uh, does it belong to me? Uh, should it be removed or not? Because it is not clear where is the boundary between the free speech and the uh, moderated speech, uh, how to minimize the harms but defend the democracy. These questions are very subjective and they are not regulated. So this is a big difficult uh, field. The next field is uh, about privacy. So again, who does this data belong to and how to protect privacy? This is a field of privacy is actually very, very underexplored in NLP. Among other fields, I think there is some research on incivility, on algorithmic bias, on other fields, but very little research on uh, privacy. Uh, misinformation, so uh, information manipulation, opinion manipulation, fake news. So there is a whole range of uh, ways that data can be manipulated from generated texts and uh, disinformation to just advertisement and uh, more subtle or, or propaganda and subtle opinion manipulation. And uh, there are many, many interesting research projects that can be done really with a focus on the language of manipulation, which I think is just an interesting topic to explore. And finally, the technological divide. So when we build our tools, even if it's a part of speech tagger, who, what are populations for which, uh, which are served by these tools? So there is a certain divide, the technologies are built unequally. There is no one language, no two languages. There are 6,000 languages in the world. And there are many populations and there are certain areas of NLP which are completely uh, underexplored. For example, language varieties. We think we can solve a problem for English, the problem of dependency parsing, but we don't account for different varieties of English. What about Nigerian English? What about African-American English? What about Indian English? So there are the there is a technological divide that is currently present. As, and as you see in the bottom, this, is, uh, this picture shows that the field is highly interdisciplinary. So AI researchers cannot, cannot actually solve the problem of misinformation alone. To be able to address the problem of misinformation or hate speech, we need to have not only engineers, but also ethicists and social scientists and uh, activists and uh, um, politicians who actually are responsible for policies. 
and the linguists, because many of these phenomena are interesting phenomena which are not in words, but more in pragmatics. So this is a very interesting field scientifically, but also very challenging to work on. And uh, there are some recommended resources, and in particular, the one that might be interesting to you all is uh, CS384 is a seminar by Dan Jurovsky that has an amazing also list. So if you want to take a look on specific subfields. So this is a general overview. And now I, I want to talk about one of these uh, subfields and give some kind of explanation. Why do we have algorithmic bias in our models? So um, let's start again with interaction. I know you have the slides, but don't look forward. I want to ask you questions and please type. Which word is more likely to be used by a female, giggle or laugh? Just type quickly, don't think too much. So please look at the chat and see the majority response. It is uh, absolutely giggle. You are right. Next question. Which word is more likely to be used by a female, brutal or fierce? Oh, lovely. <laughs> like 99% uh, fierce. Thank you. Next question. Which word is more likely to be used by an older person, impressive or amazing? So actually from what I see, it's 100% impressive. Very impressive. Thank you for your answers. Which word is more likely to be used by a person of a higher occupational class? Suggestions or proposals? Do you see how correctly you answer my questions? So next question, why do we intuitively recognize the default social? Why do you all know the right answer? <laughs> Right, our brains are biased. So this is about implicit biases in our brains. And this is a very good example. And you can also see how language perpetuates and propagates biases, right? It's all in the language. If you can, could know from one word, who is the person who said it, you can imagine what kind of biases we can extract from a longer text. So to understand what's happening with biases, we need to understand how cognition works. So we have, this is, was introduced by Kahneman and Tversky. So conceptually, our brain is divided into system one and system two. So system one is our autopilot. It is used to make decisions without thinking. It is very fast, parallel, effortless, and so on. System two is our logical part. It knows how to analyze and make decisions that are unusual for us. So it is not automatic and it is slow, serial, controlled. Uh, it requires a lot of mental energy. So our brain constantly receives signals, all kinds of, uh, from through all the sensors, through, through eyes, ears. There is a lot of incoming data. There is a lot of pixels here around me. But the actual part of system two is only able to produce a very small portion of the signals that we received. So system one is automatic, system two is effortful. But in practice, over 95, in practice, over 95% of the signals that we receive from the world is relegated to system one. And the funny thing is, as Kahneman wrote, is that we identify ourselves with system two. We believe that we are conscious and uh, reasonable beings. But in practice, most of our decisions are made by system one. So, uh, so since we are using autopilot most of our time, our, our kind of brain uh, get every, all the information that we perceive gets categorized clusters and the, like labeled automatically. And this is how cognitive stereotypes are created. Uh, so, and there are multiple, multiple cognitive stereotypes that are aimed to fill the gaps if we don't have enough meaning or reduce information, generalize if you have too much information, 
or to complete the facts if we are missing facts and so on. And this leads to all kinds of cognitive biases. So examples of biases would be in-group favoritism. So we uh, grow up uh, seeing the majority of specific people and we tend to like those people more than the minorities. Uh, hollow effect that we know very little about the person or a specific social group, but we tend to generalize based on one trait, we could generalize about the whole group and to other traits. Uh, and so on. There are many biases. Um, and uh, thanks to these stereotypes, if I, if I asked you the questions, the words, or if I show you these pictures, you immediately know this is uh, calming, cute, tasty. And if I show these pictures, you will know that maybe it's dangerous, unpleasant, and automatically when we see a snake, we will not, we'll automatically step down, right? Step, step back. And we only need to um, make system, to invo evoke system two, for example, if we decide to touch it. But most of our decisions are automatic. And this is the same exactly mechanism that creates social stereotypes in our brains. So we exactly in the same mechanism internalize these associations uh, and uh, make generalizations about specific groups. So, and this is why when, when I ask you which word is more likely to use by an older person, 100% of you typed that um, the word impressive would be used. And importantly, these implicit biases are very pervasive and they operate unconsciously. And one important property is that they are transitive. So basically we are, people, we are seeing that a black person is playing basketball and in a movie we see that a black person uses drugs and we immediately connect it and reinforce the, for example, the associations with the specific groups. And the social stereotypes are not necessarily uh, all negative. I can name some uh, on the surface positive stereotypes for example, Asians are good in math. Importantly, they all have negative effect, even seemingly positive stereotypes, because they pigeonhole individuals and put expectations of them, or they can just be harmful. And then how do these biases manifest? They manifest in language. And for example, they manifest in subtle microaggressions. Uh, and importantly, Microaggressions uh, should not correlate necessarily with sentiment. So th sentiment analysis tools would not detect them. On the surface level, microaggressions can be negative, neutral, or positive, like in these examples, but they actually bring prolonged harms, even if they are meant as a compliment. And there was a lot of research in social sciences that showed that they can even bring more harms that overt hate speech because they implicit, they kind of bring a significant emotional harm and reinforce problematic stereotypes. So if I will collect these conversations from Twitter, do I look okay? You are so pretty. Is this a positive or negative? It's probably positive interaction. And then the next interaction, check out my new physics paper. Is it positive or negative interaction? Uh, why physics? Are you so, you're so pretty. So we don't know. We don't have the right context. And then for this question, do I look okay? And uh, all kinds of uh, responses. For example, you are so pretty for your age. In this case, these are negative. These are microaggressions. They make us cringe, right? And then the problem is that all of this human generated data, which is necessarily kind of in, incorporates a lot of microaggressions and just stereotypes that we all have, we are not aware of them. Uh, it, is, it is fed to our systems. So there is a lot of bias in language, like stereotypes or historical biases that are perpetuated. For example, there are more photos of uh, men doctors than female doctors on the web. Uh, or human reporting biases. Uh, and later there are biases also in our data sets. So for example, what kind of data we sample for annotation? 
from which kind of populations, from which language varieties, from which locations, and then who are we choosing as annotators? So there is a bias in who are annotators that will annotate our data. And then there is bias, or cognitive biases of annotators themselves, how they treat, what is the microaggression and what is not, or and, and other questions. And all these types of biases later propagate into our computational systems. And this is how we get from cognitive bias, social cognitive biases to algorithmic biases. Because if you remember system one is system two, currently the way we develop systems, AI is only system one. And why is that? Because currently the way we kind of develop our tools, the, dominant paradigm is a data centric approach. So we need a lot of data to train good models and we do know well how to leverage a lot of data. But again, language is about people. It is produced by people. Uh, and But our existing systems, they, uh, they do not leverage social cultural context. We don't know how to incorporate uh, kind of, we, we don't do it usually. We don't incorporate which social biases are positive and which inductive biases are good and which inductive biases are bad to have. So overall, our models are really powerful and they're powerful at making generalizations, but we don't know how to control for the right inductive biases, which biases, which inductive biases are good and which inductive biases are not. And then to going to the next point is that these models are opaque, right? We don't also know how to interpret well deep learning networks, which means it's not easy to analyze them and spot the problems. So, uh, and as you can guess, this is not only related to the field of ethical NLP. These are just interesting research questions, how to incorporate social and cultural knowledge into deep learning models, or how to uh, develop interpreted interpretation approaches. Uh, so, uh, what is missing? Today, uh, what is missing, for example, is that existing uh, classifiers for toxicity de detection, if we want to build data analytics to, to clean up our data before it propagates to the models, uh, we know only how to detect overt toxic language, such as hate speech because we are primarily sampling our data and training our data based on lexicons. And th there is almost no focus on actual um, microaggressions and more subtle biases, which are often not in words, but in pragmatics of the conversation and, and understanding who are the people involved in the conversation. So uh, today's tools that could be applied to these kind of microaggressions uh, or hate speech detection or sentiment analysis, but they will necessarily fail. The next point is that, again, our models do not incorporate social cultural knowledge and the, uh, basically the same comment can be toxic or non-toxic depending on who are the people involved in the conversation. But uh, our models are data centric and not people centric. And uh, uh, the more general problem is that the deep learning models are really good at picking spurious correlations. And uh, uh, this is why, for example, in this paper, the three comments which change, which uh, the only difference in these uh, three sentences is the name and probably the association of this name with uh, race or ethnicity. So our models do pick up on spurious confounds. So we think we predict sentiment, but we also predict all kinds of labels that correlate with sentiment, but not necessarily are true predictors of sentiment, for example, gender or race. And this is something very pervasive. So, and finally, the models are not explainable. So we kind of have these deficiencies just in core approaches to deep learning and we have all of this data and with this data, we train conversational agents, personal assistants, all kinds of systems. And the, 
Why do we care now? Because it can bring harms. So what kind of unintended harms it can bring? Um, here is an example of an image search. If you search for three black teenagers, and this is, I searched for it when I prepared this talk for the first time. So it was fixed, I guess, but this is how it was in June, 2017. And then uh, uh, when you search for a doctor, you get primarily male doctors, right? And primarily white. And if you search for a nurse, this is a stereotypical image of a nurse. And if you search for a homemaker, this is, a, this is a just top search results for this uh, query words. And if you search for CEO, it's a very specific stereotypical image of CEO. And if you search for a professor, this one is my, fav my personal favorite. So you can see all uh, male images and there is uh, only one woman. But if you look at her background, you can see these are simple mass facts. So it's just an error in the search. She's not a professor. And this is a result of, for example, speech reco uh, face recognition. So these are two examples. Uh, one camera does not recognize Asian faces and thinks they're blinked. On the right, the camera, this is a video of uh, face tracking camera that is able to track white faces, but immediately shuts down when uh, black face comes. So it is not able to track black faces. So these are all consequences of uh, biased data that propagates into models that do not incorporate intentionally, um, basically safeguards against very specific biases. Now what's going on with natural language processing? So this is a slide from the very beginning that just please all possible applications that I could think about. As you can guess, since 2016, there are many, many papers that just, I, I don't think there is any application or core technologies of NLP left, which did not expose biases in uh, NLP technologies. So here is an example of bias in uh, machine translation. So this is visual, this is why I, I'm showing it. So uh, there are languages that uh, mark Third person, uh, third person pronouns with gender and other languages that do not mark third person pronouns with gender. So if you translate with, from a language such as Hungarian or from Estonian that uh, don't uh, mark third person pronoun with gender into English, which does mark third person pronoun with a gender, you might see similar results. You will not see them now. This is. Uh, what was exposed maybe a year or two ago. So basically from translation from they are the nurse, this would be she's a nurse, but they are the scientists. The translations could be he is a scientist and same for engineer, baker, teacher. So all the stereotypes, just historical stereotypes that you could think about. So what are possibilities to fix it? Uh, one way to fix it is uh, actually simple. You could treat the uh, target gender just as a target language is multilingual NMT. So I, I don't know, but I, I suspect you did look at this paper on uh, multilingual neural machine translation. And uh, basically you can add an, another token, for example, and you can controllably generate into female or male translation. So the fix is not difficult, but you need to be aware of potential dangers to be able to fix model. And importantly, this is not about only about fixing the model itself, but also about fixing the user interface, right? So the way Google fixed this interface is they provided different translation. Uh, so basically all possible translations for different genders. So, and the similar kind of harms were shown, especially in dialogue systems. So occasionally such models make big headings in news like Microsoft's entire chatbot that became very racist and sexist overnight. And the GPT-3 based models that uh, was offering a suicide advice. And about two weeks ago, there was a Korean chatbot that became extremely homophobic very quickly, quickly and had to be removed. So these titles come up again, this 
the headlines coming again and again and again. And I guess the point here is that what we, the way we do NLP today, I call it a reactive approach. So we have a, we expose a specific problem, a, bi, a problem in search, a problem in uh, chatbots, racist chatbots, or a problem in machine translation, and then it, it gives it creates bad publicity, and then we start debiasing the models. But it's not necessarily that we need to develop the tools in this way, right? So I hope that kind of in the future we make a paradigm shift towards a more proactive approach. And the, the specific, uh, uh, what would proactive approach uh, require is, for example, um, building new data analytics. So basically, rather than exposing biases, going further up the pipeline and starting actually with the data, and building automatic moderators and data analytics that can identify problematic text, problematic images beyond overtly hate speech. And then incorporating the right inductive biases into the models and understanding what kind of uh, understanding moving from the uh, data centered approaches to people centered approaches, incorporating social, cultural, and pragmatic knowledge. And in modeling, there are interesting research questions on how to demote spurious confounds, but predict only the target label, not necessarily the, uh, picking up on spurious correlations. And finally, on building more interpretable models. And importantly, that these are not orthogonal research directions. So for example, to build good data analytics, you necessarily need to maybe have an interpretable model and also be able to incorporate the right social cultural knowledge because again, the microaggressions, the text is not necessarily in words. So what I was going to do, um, if I had time, is I, would, I was going to show two case studies from research studies from my group that specifically focus on these data analytics, uh, the identifying unsupervised bias or an, an interpretable model for making uh, hate speech classifiers more robust. But I will skip it because we are out of time. You could show what you've still got a few minutes. You could show one quickly <laughs> for five minutes. <laughs> so basically, we are we are trying to build this like green boxes. It's what we have today, hate speech or sentiment analysis, but we are trying to build a new kind of class of uh, models specifically for social bias analysis. And in these uh, models, we would want to detect who are the people involved, so who the comment, for example, is directed to, if it's a conversational domain, and also to understand what kinds of microaggressions these are, and also to maybe generate uh, explanations or interpretations through building more interpretable models. And uh, basically these are the two papers that I was going to talk about. One is an unsupervised approach to detection gender bias. And one is on if we have just few examples of microaggressions and the classifier of hate speech, these examples of microaggressions are adversarial examples to the classifier. The classifier is not able to deal with them. But what we can do, we can focus on interpretability of the classifier and specifically making the classifier understanding for each probing example, which examples in the training data influenced the classifier's decision. So ch changing the approach to interpretability from interpreting specific salient words in the input of the classifier into looking at the training data, sorting the training data and identifying which examples were most influential for classifier predictions. So using influence functions, for example, um, uh, this is a paper that uh, Percy uh, published in 2017. And uh, through this classifier, we are able to surface microaggressions despite that the classifier makes the wrong prediction. So this is just a high level, <laughs> very high level summary without talking about the actual studies. So I will skip 
let me just skip the actual papers and the slides are there i'm happy to discuss later i just don't want to go over time so to summarize the field of uh, computational ethics is super interesting and there are interesting problems that are technically interesting they're challenging so you don't need to have a separate kind of important problems and the technically interesting problems we can work on important problems which are also technically interesting and focus on important things like um, building better deep learning models and these are interesting subfields and if some of you are interested in specific projects so it's just in our course we we just put together um, a presentation that um, just summarizes all kinds of possible projects that you could do and thank you very much Hey. I wish I could see the audience. This is so weird, um, <laughs> but it's okay. Well, thank you, Yulia, for that great talk. Um, yeah, so um, if people would like to ask some questions to Yulia, um, if you raise your hand, um, we can promote you to be panelists. And I think then we can even have you turn on your cameras if you if you want to show <laughs> Yulia a real human being. Um, um, but, you know, if we're waiting to see if there are um, people who would like to do that, I mean, there is one question that's um, outstanding at the moment, which is, um, do these bots become racist, sexist so quickly after exposure to the public due to the public intentionally trying to right. bias them? Or is it that common talk among the public is racist, sexist enough to bias any model upon exposure? <laughs> So I think this is both, but in the case, for example, of Thaibot, the way it was built is it's a continual learning system. So it collects uh, inputs from people and then uses them as a kind of training examples uh, to generate forward answers. And uh, people, as usually people pick up on such things very quickly, and then uh, they intentionally became racist and uh, sexist again the, against the bot. And the bot very quickly learned to just mimic the people's behavior. So it was some malicious attempt to kind of turn this bot into racist and sexist. Uh, but this is how the model was designed to collect uh, inputs from people, uh, but not monitor the kind of sentences that are used or not used in the training data. So this is again going back to the discussion of that we actually don't have good analytics. Many of these analytics are, these are just blacklists or whitelists. They're very, very primitive. It's not very easy to incorporate such constraints into generation or automatic filtering of data. There is another question. Can I ask my question? Yes. Oh, yes. So I guess you guys both oh, questions in the Q and A and live people. So we got let ask the question and. Yeah, so I'm curious. Uh, I I maybe I'm going to a little bit more about how you measure your model's performance. Um, are there actually public benchmark data sets you can, uh, or any sort of well-defined metric that you can sort of uh, objectively measure your model's improvements? Are you talking about specifically our papers that I skipped? Um, or just in general, are there, I mean, I know it's a very new field and maybe it's harder to define really objective a measure of bias. Mm -hmm. So how, is, how do you measure progress in general? Well, you can also just mention- This is a good question. It's very I'm difficult. It's like there are, there is growing body of data sets for example, in UDAB, Jin Choi's group created a social bias infer inference corpus, or in, I don't remember what I, SBIC. Uh, overall, the problem of evaluation is actually very difficult. And there are some problems in which there are um, existing evaluation data sets. If you think about hate speech, for example, there are all kinds of uh, data sets. There are many data sets for training and evaluating um, hate performance of hate speech classifiers. Uh, but when we think about biases, um, there are much less. And the, the big problem here, it's not easy to collect such a data set. So if you think 
let me actually show why, why it is difficult to collect the data set of say of microaggressions. So a naive solution would be to, uh, so if you think about the standard way of da data collection, so we would sample some data from the internet and we give it to mechanical torque uh, annotators and uh, then they would analyze, is it bias or not? And we build the supervised classifier. So this is what we cannot do in the case of most subtle biases. First, because we don't have a strong lexical sieve to sample the right data. Because again, these biases are not in words. What like you just sample from the whole Reddit corpus. It's not clear how to annotate, to make it feasible, not too expensive. But more importantly that every annotator will incorporate their own biases. So you actually need very well trained annotators and multiple annotations per sample. So the question of how to create such a data set is very, very difficult. In our study, we collected the, so there is a corp, uh, website called microaggressions.com that uh, has uh, self-reported microaggressions. When people actually recall experiences of um, uh, microaggressions against them and uh, quote them. And uh, this is what we use to evaluate our data. But like data collection is as a uh, big problem currently as um, just modeling. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, no. Yeah. I don't have any other questions to ask. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I should go on. Um, okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, uh, thanks for the yeah, great lecture. It's a very appropriate topic for the past guest lecture. Um, so I took the course CS 182, uh, which introduced many notions of fairness through case studies and like assignments. Uh, and I've been thinking a lot about some of these notions. And in the course, there was like a mention for uh, research done by Kleinberg, who showed uh, three different notions of fairness can't be simultaneously satisfied. The calibration, which is like the probability of outcome given risk scores, the false positive rate, the false negative rate, and not all be like completely independent across mm -hmm. protective traits. So if like past a certain point, you know, these metrics just become direct trade-offs, uh, is it the case that fairness becomes subjective after that? And, and I guess like more generally, you know, in ethics research, has there been frameworks of creating sort of upper bounds or constraints among these different metrics. Uh, so we sort of measure how close we get to the ideal. Mm -hmm. This is a very difficult question. So right, the fairness uh, research, there are actually proofs that you cannot satisfy both uh, um, the measures of, um, the perfor performance and inclusivity. And uh, this is why they are measured separately false positives, false negatives. And uh, uh, the question is whether it, because of, because of this issue, whether it becomes subjective, um, it's even bigger, I guess. The question here is even bigger because um, the question of inclusivity, so it competes with the question of monetization. We, like if you think who are the main owners of data and how they train algorithms, the goal is to basically have better monetization, like who will see this advertisement. But uh, uh, there is a competing objective of inclusivity. Who like, to, will this advertisement reach out to all kinds of populations? And uh, it's not only, it's not subjective. There is a kind of, there is a clear incentive, for example, in companies to maximize monetization rather than inclusivity, right? Because it's also internal. I, I don't have an easy answer to this. I agree, it can be subjective or can be 
worse than its objective because like these objectives are com compete. So would you say it's sort of more uh, the field of you know ethics research overall is more interdisciplinary and you know a lot of these answers to the, these questions are more context dependent. It's very context dependent, right? It is very context dependent. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, for example, the, the same application in, in different uh, contexts can be uh, used for good and for bad, right? And uh, different thresholds on uh, performance can be applied for different types of, for different settings. And also, I really think, like, I, I'm not qualified even to answer this question, right? We should ask uh, maybe a philosopher or experts in policy, right? Because eventually I'm, um, I, I know how to build the, the tools. And I'm trying to, like, I, I'm trying to make technologies uh, kind of more ethical. But the, the question of okay. how they are deployed and what are specific decisions, it's, um, it's very difficult to control for and to kind of give uh, definite answers about this. Well, here's another yeah. difficult question for you from, and you can't use that cop-out answer. <laughs> um, so you said earlier you showed the example of AI data with the question of why would we want to study this? The author is justified by claiming that given the widespread use of facial recognition, our findings have critical implica implications for the protection of civil liberties. Given that some unscrupulous governments may indeed implement such technology to oppress minorities based on such right. things as orientation, do social scientists have an obligation to get ahead of this threat by understanding the properties of such models? How do we weigh the ethical trade-offs? Oh gosh. <laughs> Now I need to respond from the point of view of all social scientists. I, I, I don't want to answer philosophical questions, but I, I kind of, I have the answer about uh, a kind of maybe a simple answer to why I don't agree with uh, the claim of researchers that we need to expose this technology, to publish actually this paper to expose the dangers of this technology. Uh, one of them, like the knife analogy that I gave is one of the answers. So if you think about a um, similar field, like not a similar field, but a similar type of interaction uh, in um, security, right? In cybersecurity. So it, it's very common to kind of break the algorithm to show its vulnerabilities and then to iteratively fix it. So this is like the approach that researchers took. Let's uh, show the vulnerabilities that, like, that we are able to build this technology to expose its threats. But unlike with uh, uh, security field, here the kind of exposure of this technology, publication of this technology can have uh, real uh, implications of uh, human lives. So the, again, the cost of misclassification and uh, if we think about other problems, like similar problems, uh, like the problems of, like, I, I can give uh, many other similar problems in which we can expose this technology which will harm people. Like let's, uh, let's create a deep fakes video, a porn video with uh, professors. Uh, we, we can do it, right? To expose the danger of technology of deep fakes. Uh, but what kind of harm it will bring to specific people who were involved in this kind of exposure of the harm of this technology. So I have the answer of why kind of it was wrong to publish this study in the first place and uh, why it's not productive and not helpful, but it's very difficult to answer the question, what should social scientists do? I don't know. Okay. Well, I could like ask the question next. Oh, it's just disappeared, right? Oh, wait, I think, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the talk. That's really interesting. And as we've just seen, really challenging stuff. Um, I guess my question is a little bit more practical. So maybe that's a, a reprieve for you. But um, I like, unfortunately, it seems like in a lot of 
um, NLP and AI more broadly, some of this ethics and bias stuff is like kind of an afterthought. Um, a lot of projects don't really necessarily take it into the into account from the outset, and it's more sort of incidental. Um, so my question is, like, you know, as we're working on um, NLP projects, maybe even our, our final course project, like, what are some kind of concrete steps that we can take or like a systematic approach that we can use to sort of incorporating some of this ethics um, knowledge in things that might not explicitly seem like they have a lot to do with ethics. So it depends on the project, right? I, it's like, I cannot answer generally if the, the first part of the lecture was exactly about this. Uh, if, I, if I build my project, what kind of questions I can ask to know if there are some pitfalls? If uh, it's a, like, if it's a different project, I think uh, overall, these are important questions which are general for deep learning models, which could be later used to create a better technology. So how to incorporate understanding who are the people who produce the language or who are the users of incorporating the right inductive biases or a technology for demoting confounds. It doesn't have to be like specifically on ethics related problems or interpretability of deep learning. It doesn't have to be ethics kind of project, but the kind of technology, if you can develop such a technology, eventually it can be useful for building such better like proactive proactively models that proactively prevent uh, unintended harms. So I guess the the strategy would be sort of to just lay out these these general topics, pose these questions to yourself, maybe write them down or just think about them and then proceed as such. Yeah, so I this is how I think about it. I, I think about potential, like if this technology would be deployed what could be corner cases? What is potential for dual use? Uh, if it works, how kind of how can it be misused? And uh, also, when it doesn't work, what kind of errors can be harmful? So this is uh, like if you go back to in the slides to the beginning of the lecture, these questions they could be applied to many kinds of technology, and it, they they give a more clear kind of guidelines to what things, how like bad outcomes could be prevented. I'm sure I, maybe I'm missing something totally, right? It's all of this content, much of this content is just, I came up about on, with it by reading a lot of uh, different papers, but there is no clear guidelines. It's such a new field. So maybe there are things that I'm also missing. Here's another question from um, are models wrong for being biased? In the end, they just learn what they're designed to learn. And isn't our intervention to correct this behavior actually a cause of bias? This is a good question. So it is kind of, it, it is a question that I also have been thinking about. Like uh, are models wrong for, for example, reflecting accurately the real world, right? Do we need to debias a actively models to, to make them fair when the world is not fair, when our data is not fair. Um, so first of all, the way we train models today, they don't only perpetuate biases, they amplify biases. So this is a um, natural behavior of a machine learning model uh, that basically when you have a, you have an input example for which the confidence is lower, it will default to a majority class. This is why um, if your data contains biases, these biases will be amplified in a, in a machine learning model trained on this data. And this is clearly wrong. <laughs> uh, whether it is wrong to kind of to build models that do not reflect the actual true distribution in the data, it's a much more difficult questions, but 
there are clear there are clear kind of cases in which I would say it is wrong to build a model that uh, that uh, in the search for CEO shows only male CEOs why while kind of because it amplifies biases but yeah this is already a subjective kind of answer it's just my personal opinion it has not much to do with the research that we are doing right or well would you like to ask your question uh yeah one sec let me Okay, I was trying to start my video, but it's saying I can't, so I guess I'm just going to ask. Um, By the way, I don't uh, see people anyway. In... Well, you yeah. could take a start video, but yeah, anyway, let's just go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll just ask. Oh, yeah, so thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a question on microaggressions. Um, so who is to decide what is, what is considered a microaggression? Is it the people whom microaggressions are potentially targeted against? Is it philosophers or social scientists or just, you know, people in education? And then case opinions differ, you know, do we just listen to the majority? Um, it all seems crucially important to me, but very, very difficult to standardize and kind of mm -hmm. reach a consensus, especially because different yeah. cultures perceive things differently. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for these questions. These are amazing questions. These are difficult questions. This is why we did not create our own corpus of microaggressions. Right, because it's culturally dependent. It's very, very personal, subjective. This is why we pers we focused on a corpus of uh, perceived microaggressions, people that actually uh, felt that uh, the interactions were negative mm -hmm. because they knew that these were microaggressions. It's um, Who is to decide whether something is microaggression? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> this is very difficult. difficult. Uh, uh, what I what I can think about like practical solutions about it. Um, I would uh, say have a very well trained annotators who understand what microaggression is so kind of we explain what is microaggression they they see many examples they understand uh, kind of that for example uh, a sentence that targets a minority group or, oh. uh, and other things and then have many annotators per one sentence so like in uh, say the study like this is about other um, social concepts that are abstract. For example, uh, in uh, Dan Jurovsky's study on uh, respect in police interactions, respect is also a subjective thing, right? So what they did, they took every utterance and they had multiple annotators, multiple trained annotators for each utterance and uh, just increased kind of the number of wo voters of whether uh, an utterance is respectful or not. So like practically, I think this should be the kind of procedure for creating corpus of microaggressions. But uh, a more philosophical question is who is, who is to decide? And it's, um, it's a more difficult one. Yeah, got it, thank you. So there are still more questions, but you're allowed to say that you're worn out at any point, Yulia. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, the next I, question... I feel, I feel bad about not being able to answer big <laughs> questions about uh, society. And <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm and happy to answer. The next question from is, um, can you talk a bit more about the unsupervised approach to identifying implicit bias? I can. It's... Um, I just need to think how to talk about it in a few words. So intuitively, we cannot create a corpus of um, like, which has an utterance, um, which has an utterance and then a label, is it sentence biased or not? So we create a causal framework 
in which uh, our target label is more objective. Who is, who is the sentence directed to, to a man or to a woman? So our labels are gender labels. Uh, and the, in a naive way, if given a sentence towards a person without looking at the actual person and the, their comment, just by this comment towards the person, we can predict if it's directed to a woman, uh, we can say that kind of there is some bias in the mo that, that uh, there is some bias in the sentence. But uh, it's a naive approach because uh, there are other kind of um, ways in which we can predict the target gender, but uh, which will not be associated with bias. For example, it's the context of the conversation, the traits of the person that we are writing to and so on. So the crux of our technology is that we predict gender, but demote all kinds of confounds in the task of detecting bias. So we demote the signals of um, the source sentence. We demote the latent traits of the target person. And so we make this task very difficult to detect who is a target, uh, what is a target gender. And if after all these demotions of the confounds, given a uh, utterance that is directed to a specific person, we can still classify this utterance that is clearly directed to a woman, we, it is likely that this utterance contains bias. So what I was going to talk is all kinds of demotion approaches that we develop. But once we demote these approaches and uh, um, we can still predict the utterances, uh, who, what is the gender of the target and receive, we actually can surface some uh, biased sentences. So these are the main findings. For example, if we look at uh, comments directed to politicians, after all these demotions, and we see comments that um, kind of clearly predict uh, target gender, we can see that uh, comments toward politicians talk about their spouses, about their family love, and also like, about uh, their competence, maybe question their competence. And if we look at comments towards public fi figures like actresses, we can see a lot of words that are just related to objectification, sexualization, regardless of their source content. So they can talk about their movie, but the comments will always be about um, that uh, she is sexy. And uh, this is what our model is able to surface, but it's again, it's just initial study, needs okay. a lot of work. Okay, so around here also, Asks if microaggressions are pulled from a site where people can list what they have experienced, isn't that data very vulnerable to social engineering? <laughs> uh, yes, this data is vulnerable. So in our case, we uh, anonymize this data. We extract only quotes from the data. We remove the actual users who, pop, who, who published it, we remove all the text around these quotes. And uh, this is a good question. Maybe we should also not make this uh, data public even yet. Hey, um, there are more good questions. Question. Thank you. M more questions. Um, so- uh, By the uh, way, like if uh, Chris, John and other like, I'm saying Chris John because these are the two faces, <laughs> the other faces that I see on my screen. So, um, please let me know when we need to finish. I'm happy to continue answering. We've questions. often gone on for a few more minutes, so I can ask okay. a couple more questions. Um, so here's one that's very prominent in AI right at the moment. Um, do you think it is fair for AI scientists and tech and academia who are definitely not representative of the general population to decide what is biased and what is not, i.e. the act of debiasing itself might be biased. Yeah, this is one problem also that, this is like more general problem that researchers, even those who work on debiasing can incorporate their own biases. Um, We currently don't have any other alternative, right? We don't have uh, training how to do it. We don't have, like, I think it's a good thing to work on these topics, to try to promote these topics as much as possible. 
with an awareness that uh, we as researchers can incorporate our own biases. So this is what like we also write in the ethical implication sections in the paper that uh, we try to identify bias, we try to debias, but there are limitations to this study because we could incorporate our own biases into our analysis, right? This is how we interpreted these results. Maybe this is what we were looking for, and this is a confirmation bias. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe um, should just have a, one more. Oh no, a new question just turned up. Maybe we'll have to be two questions more. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's all coming in. I, um, um, now it's. I mean, maybe I should do that one immediately because it directly relates to that answer. Um, which was um, from how are the perspectives of community stakeholders, i.e. people from minoritized groups included when these systems are being built? Mm, this is a wonderful question too, yeah. Currently not very good. Actually, we have currently have a paper also in submission about analysis of what kind of, how race have been treated in NLP systems, starting from data sets to models to, potential users. And uh, one of the things that we found is that even people who work on uh, identifying racism, they don't involve um, actually in-group members. Uh, this is, yeah, you identified yet another problem in uh, the community that perspectives of community are not often incorporated. In our position paper, we try to advocate for its importance, but uh, like all these questions are very good, but like there are maybe first somebody like Chris who has a lot of influence <laughs> could make changes <laughs> in the community. It's very difficult to make uh, such changes. I guess I'm hopeful that there's actually starting to be a bit of change right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, like one can be pessimistic given the history and one can be pessimistic um, given the current statistics. But, you know, I actually believe that, you know, through recent events of Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. other things, that there's actually just more genuine attempts to create change around well, certainly the Stanford Computer Science Department, but I think more generally around the field of AI than there's been at any time in the past 30 years when I've been watching it. Right. Even when I did my postdoc at Stanford in 2016, um, we started working on the problem of gender bias and it was total outlier. Like I didn't know if what I'm doing will be relevant to anyone. And uh, now, look, we discussed this as a kind of relevant question. This is already an amazing change in the community. And if there will be more focus also on uh, the right hiring, which clearly now has more awareness than ever. Like, right, I'm also more optimistic now than say three years ago. <laughs> okay, well maybe we'll but these do are this. All wonderful questions for which there are no good answers yet, yeah. Um. Maybe you can do this as the last question, um, unless you say something that really um, elicits a lot more. Um, what do you think the social and ethics space might look like, say, five to 10 years down the line? Do you think the industry might come down to a unified standard of ethics for AI systems? Given that a lot of the challenges come from the fact that social and ethics discussions are often subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm also optimistic about the field of ethics in five years. These are difficult problems. The, the field of ethics, by the way, itself is 2000 years old, right? <laughs> Aristotle already asked these questions. And now we're asking these questions about AI, but uh, given the current awareness and the, uh, and the, uh, and of the bad publicity is that company get, currently companies are the main players, right? It's more even than uh, governments. And uh, there is a big incentive at companies to fix things because of the bad publicity. <laughs> and uh, 
for example, today I read an article about uh, that Google will stop uh, uh, adver stop advertisement that track uh, that profile users, like these plugins. Uh, so overall, I do see a very positive trajectory. It's very difficult to predict what exactly will be like in five years. I don't think all the problems will be resolved, but overall I'm optimistic also about um, like that, that the new policies will be already that not like not entirely in hands of decisions of companies. And definitely about research, because I, I see how many students now are interested in uh, these topics, which is totally amazing. Okay. Oh, and another comment that I want to make is actually NLP is important in all this, uh, which was much less, say, the field of fairness, very much focused on image recognition. But I think more and more, we will see more and more research on NLP and language, which is also exciting. Okay, uh, well, maybe um, we should call it quits at that point. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, Thank you so much.